on the road. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for what we've already heard today by way of challenge. We pray that as we examine this passage of Scripture, you will open it to us. Pray within us, Father, a desire of com- uh, uh, compassion, a desire to have the heart of the Lord beating in our heart so that we will be what you want us to be. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, and you may be seated. Just uh, so you are forewarned, I gave Jim five minutes today, and he gave me an hour today, so you know what you're in for. Uh, if I do kind of the same ratio that he did. So uh, we'll try and actually tone that down a little bit so you don't get too afraid here. By the way, you may have noticed uh, a a new guitar player. He's kind of down at the back, but uh, Alex is a uh, student at UNC that um, Patty and I got linked up with uh, on a program that they have over there. We found out he plays guitar and he came over, met Melody, and apparently passed the test. He's majoring in music. And uh, so we're happy to have you, Alex, uh, playing guitar this morning with us. Thank you very much. Well, in this passage of Scripture, as we've started on it the last couple of weeks, we've already looked at the challenge of the commission that Jesus gives here in verse 1. We've looked at the uh, kind of the overview of the commission from that verse. We've looked at the, at the uh, I, I'm sorry, the commission we've looked at in verse 1, the challenge of the commission, that, the, that the, there's a lot of people out there that need the gospel And yet the laborers are few, and so there's a great challenge here. We've looked at the commands, pray and go. This morning we want to look at the conditions, the conditions that we should expect as we go. And Jesus is really right out of the chute letting us know this is not going to be easy. He doesn't mince words about what the conditions are going to be like. Twofold of conditions, the atmosphere, and then the attitude that we need to have. Verse 3 is the atmosphere. He says, go your way. Behold, I am sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. I think you can tell right away by that phraseology, Jesus is no prosperity gospel preacher, right? Not even close. That's not where he goes. He never builds illusions that are incorrect, never builds expectations that relate just to this world. It's absolutely the highest privilege on earth that we can have to represent Christ, but he wants us to know it's dangerous. I'm sending you out like lambs among wolves. You know, in preparing for this sermon, I read a little bit about the, some accounts of what wolves do to people when they attack, and I'll spare you the gory details, but basically what's left is a pile of bones when that happens. Sometimes, using fire or firearms or axes or other implements of warfare. Human beings can fight off a pack of wolves, but imagine a helpless little lamb being surrounded by a pack of wolves. And that's what Jesus says is our situation. What's he trying to tell us? Well, two things. He's telling us, number one, persecution is going to come. Expect it. Expect it. That's the realm you're in. And secondly, he's telling us, you're going to be absolutely dependent on me because just like a lamb is helpless before attacking wolves, so you will be helpless in the midst of the world to which I am sending. You want to get a look at the Christian life from Jesus' perspective. Turn with me to John chapter 15. This is enlightening. It's it's not the passage we read very often. But the message is right, and it corresponds to what Jesus is saying in Luke 10. John 15, beginning in verse 18, Jesus says this, If the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember, remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Beloved, Jesus is telling us that persecution is automatic for followers of Christ. You don't have to go look for it. 
It just happens if you're really living a Christian life. We have to make sure that it's the message that's giving the offense and causing the persecution and not our attitude that somehow stirs it up. But Jesus is saying, look, expect persecution. I know it's going to be there. I'm sending you out anyway. Now, why does this happen? Jesus explains further in John 15, go down to verse 21. He says, but all these things they will do to you on account of my name. People are very happy to talk about God. They're not very happy often to talk about Jesus Christ, are they? It's the name of Jesus that's so, so divisive as we'll see even later in Luke. He says, because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have been guilty of sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen and hated both me and my father. But the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without a cause. What's Jesus saying? He's saying simply this, beloved, that people don't take naturally toward a, feel naturally good toward a God who says, I love you, but you're accountable. I love you, but you are sinful. And the only way I can really show my love for you is to ask you, because you can never measure up to my standard. You can never be perfect. So the only way you can be a part of my family is to accept the gift of life that I give you based on the death of my own son, but you must be accountable. People love the love part. They hate the accountability part. You know, I'm grateful that we don't face the same life-threatening situations that many in the world do, right? I'm sure you feel the same way. We see that so much more clearly even in the last few weeks and months than we usually do. But beloved, as our own society becomes more godless, the persecution will surely intensify. We have to expect that. The persecution will get worse. You know, You've probably noticed this, but people willingly agree with God's verdict about the evil in other people, right? So I think today you could go around the United States and you would find great support for the idea of let's go fight the Islamic nation, those guys that are killing Christian children. We're all into that. Somebody else's sin. But when we point out our own personal sin, or where the Lord points out our own personal sin, we're not so quick to line up, are we? And thus, those of us who will stand back and condemn the nation of Islam because of what they're doing are the same ones who have looked on with approval for the last 40 years as American parents have murdered 60 million of their own children. Abortion on demand without consequence. We're killing as many people in our nation, beloved, in our own homes as the Nazis did on an annual basis. And to speak against it is to be called an extremist. We define sexuality in our own terms. And even churches have accepted that, hey, premarital sex is just normal. It's, everybody's doing it, it can't be that bad. God hasn't changed his mind, beloved. We even have people telling us that, hey, adultery might even be a positive good occasionally. To speak against these things is to be labeled a hopeless relic from an earlier age. And we all know that the tolerance of homosexuality has reached the point, and I'm not talking about homosexual people or people that have a tendency, I'm talking about the sin of homosexuality We've reached such a point of tolerance for that that it will soon be labeled a hate crime subject to imprisonment. It's just a question of time. Unless our society in general turns to God. We have been in our nation so protected for so long by the moderating influence of the gospel that Western civilization has been built on that we have forgotten We've forgotten that persecution is a normal part of the Christian experience, not something that's exceptional. 
but we're soon going to have a, a revelation that that's what it really is like to name the name of Christ because the time is coming if we don't have revival, pray for revival. Some of you could testify this morning that if you lived your Christian faith in all of its integrity in your job, you would risk promotion and you might even risk your, your job if you live totally within the principles of the Bible. Should we be surprised? I don't think so. God warned through Paul in 2 Timothy 3.12, indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. So why does Jesus send us out as lambs in the midst of wolves? Doesn't he care? Believe me, beloved, he cares more than we could ever imagine, but here's what he knows. He knows the same thing that the church father Tertullian said, which is the gospel, the, 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 what waters the gospel is the blood of the martyrs. That's what makes it come alive to people. People come to Christ because they see others suffering in a way that they can't imagine. It's not our success. We have this, you know, we grew up in, many of you were raised in the same kind of homes I were. We grew up with this idea that our affluence and our success socially is the thing that will bring people to Christ. And so we put success stories in front of people. But believe me, they are not impressed with our success. They have their own ticket. They just say, hey, if Jesus is your ticket and that works for you, great. But what they cannot explain is somebody who loves their neighbor and then loves their enemies. What they can't explain is somebody who takes persecution and then turns around and gives love back. They can't explain a person like, like this lady named Michelle who lived in a neighborhood where there was another lady named Barbara Robito. These, this was all in, in Southern California not that long ago. Michelle lived a joyful, gracious, loving Christian life, and she was dubbed by Barbara the neighborhood Bible thumper. Slight persecution. Every summer, she would load up her kids, to the, load up the van as much as she could with kids to go to VBS. Barbara was constantly looking. She was sure if she just looked deep enough, she would find flaws, but all she could find was compassion and kindness and gentleness and patience and love in Michelle's life. Well, one afternoon, she happened to be over at Michelle's house when Michelle's son came home and ran in the house. He was being attacked by some neighborhood bullies. Tears were falling from his eyes. They had been throwing stones at him. He was on his way home from school hollering, Jesus freak, Jesus freak. What would you do? Michelle calmly comforted her son. She showed him in the Seventh chapter of Acts, how the first martyr of the church, Stephen, had been stoned for the sake of the name of Christ, and then she led her son to pray for the salvation of those bullies. Later, Barbara got her aside, and she said, Michelle, how could you possibly stay so calm? How could you stay so composed? Why didn't you call the police? Here's how Michelle responded. She said, you know, I'm just trying to fight. She said, I, listen, don't think I'm not mad. I'm so mad... I'd like to grab all those kids by the neck. But she said, I'm trying to follow the Lord's instructions in Romans 12, 14, where he says, bless those who persecute you. Bless and curse not. And I don't know if she read a little further, but she could have down in verse 19 and found out, hey, but the Lord says, vengeance is mine. Says the Lord, I will repay. That's not your job. That's my job. I've reserved it for you, for me, and you're out of bounds when you start Stepping over that line, you can imagine what happened. Barbara began to question more and more Michelle about her faith. She had question after question. She later testified this way. She said, I don't know if any in the neighborhood children found Christ that summer because of Michelle's touch, but I know I did. I found him because one family lived it in my neighborhood, and they lived it daily. It's worth it, beloved. The atmosphere is going to be difficult. It's going to be dangerous. It's going to be likely in our society increasingly more dangerous. And yet that's the way God has given us to potentially bring people to him. Listen, that's true Christianity. That's true Christianity. True Christianity is not the cars and the jewelry and the bigger homes and the cruises of the prosperity gospel preachers. It's not. 
True Christianity is the converts who come to Christ because of the persecution gospel that Jesus preached. And we have the privilege to be part of it. That's why Paul was so anxious to share in the suffering of Jesus Christ because he knew it would bring other people to Christ. Well, if that's the atmosphere, what are the attitudes? I can summarize those quickly. Travel light. That's what Jesus is going to say. Because there's persecution, because that's what this world is all about. I want you to get, I want you to travel light here so you can invest there. Travel light. Two ways to travel light. Number one, be unencumbered. Number two, be unentangled. Be unencumbered in verse 4, carry no money bag, no knapsack, no sandals. In effect, what Jesus is saying is don't be over-encumbered by physical concerns. No money bags meant, hey, don't take any financial reserves. They were going to be dependent for room and board on the communities to which they went. No knapsack, no extra food, no food reserves, no clothing reserves. No sandals meant don't go barefoot. It didn't mean no sandals at all, but don't take any extra pair. They were going on a short trip, frankly, on this time. It was short-term kind of mission work. By the way, the kind, by the way, he'll probably be embarrassed that Harlow's doing these days. He's out, you know, Kurt's down in Haiti. Harlow's up in somewhere in Divide, Colorado, helping build a Christian camp. I love to see men and women who are giving their time for the Lord. Thank you for that. Where was I? Don't be encumbered. Now, this isn't the final instruction on this issue. We know that because Jesus gives more in Luke 22. If you want to turn there quickly, you can see that Jesus comes back to this subject later on. He comes back to this subject. The night that he's arrested, he refers back to this time. He asks them to remember And in Luke 22, beginning in verse 35, he says this. He said to them, when I sent you out with no money bag or knapsack or sandals, did you lack anything? They said, nothing. He said, but now let the one who has a money bag take it and likewise a knapsack and let the one who has a sword, has no sword, Sell his cloak and get one. In other words, his point is this, beloved. He he not only was sending them short term, but he was sending them to learn a lesson. He wanted them to learn to depend on him. He said, now that you've learned that lesson of dependence because you went virtually with nothing the first time, from now on I want you to be, to go prepared, take the reasonable things with you, but realize if there's a deficiency, I'm going to make it up. Realize that your true dependence is on me. He's not saying just be stupid, He's saying, take the normal precautions, take the things you need, but understand you are depending on me. Don't get encumbered with things. It's kind of the same, when, if you go down to verse seven, you're back in Luke 10, back in Luke 10, verse seven, he goes on and he says this. He says, and, and when you go into this new town, remain in the same house, eating and drinking what they provide, for the laborer deserves his wages. Do not Do not go from house to house. Why did Jesus put that in there? Why did he say that? Here's why. Because he knew they were liable to arrive in town one day, and the next day somebody, and get get invited to to a home, and they could stay there, and the next day somebody else is going to invite them, and they find out, hey, that guy's got king-size bed. He's got HDTV in the bedroom. There's a pool outside for Pete's sake. I'm moving. He knew his disciples just like he knows you and me. He said, don't do that. I'm not sending you out there for comfort. I'm not sending you out there to have a good time. There's a mission to be accomplished, so be content. The lesson of contentment, you know, Paul learned contentment. Isn't that what he said in Philippians 4 when he said, listen, I, you know, contentment can... Content, you can be discontent whether you've got money or whether you don't, right? It's not an issue of whether we have it or whether we don't because most people who don't have it are, are obsessed with getting it. And most people who have it are obsessed with getting more. Either way, you're obsessed with the wrong thing. That's why Solomon said, listen, I don't want to be rich or poor either one. Just let me be in the middle. 
This is what Paul said in Philippians 4. He said, now I'm not speaking of being in need. He said, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger. He says, I can stay at the Hilton or I can stay in the Y. It doesn't really matter to me. Can you say that? Because why? Because I can do all things through him who strengthens me because I have a mission that's bigger than my contentment, than my satisfaction. That's an un unencumbered attitude, and that's what, the, that's what the Lord is asking for in this, in this place and time. Recognize this is a temporary life. There's a mission to be done in this temporary life. Reality is up there. Reality comes later on. When you begin to learn to live like that, believe me, there's a lot less ulcers attached to that. Realize that whatever you do have is God's. Whatever he asks you to do with it is what he wants you to do with it. I, it's a lot easier to live. Don't be encumbered. Some of you know a little bit of Civil War history. If you do, you're probably familiar with the fact that Stonewall Jackson really, nobody knew him at the beginning of the Civil War. He was, he was an eccentric teacher at a, at a small academy in Lexington, Virginia. And I mean really eccentric. I won't go into that because I don't have time. But when, when the war came, he quickly earned his reputation by, a, by a, a, an absolutely unbelievable campaign that was called the Valley Campaign that he waged in 1862 where he knew the Shenandoah Valley like the back of his hand. On the, on the, on the, on the east, there was the Blue Ridge Mountains. On the west, there was the Allegheny Mountains. And, and, and Stonewall Jackson, who had to get in and out of the passes of that valley and those mountains like nobody else. And he was outnumbered three to one the whole time that he was doing this, but over a period of 48 days, he marched his army 700 miles and he won victory after victory after victory. And the Union Army didn't know, they were going nuts. They didn't know what to do with him. But the secret was the speed with which he moved. He'd be here today and there tomorrow, and they'd, how did, how did he possibly get from here to there? He told one of his commanders, Richard Ewell, he said, I can tell you this. He said, the road to glory cannot be followed with too much baggage. That's what Jesus is saying. The road to glory, the road to what God wants us to accomplish, the road to how God wants us to accomplish it, can't be, you can't attach too much baggage to it, beloved. We're not here to see how much we can pile up. That misses the point of our existence, so we want to be content. Don't be encumbered. Secondly, be unentangled. Don't be entangled. Un in be unencumbered kind of speaks to physical things. Be unentangled kind of speaks to ambition and relationships that we get into. Look at what he says at the end of verse four. He says, greet no one on the road. Now to, to our ears, that's, I mean, you're sending them out to represent Christ, and you're saying don't greet anybody? What's that about? Sounds, sounds strange to our ears, right? Sounds unfriendly. Easton's Bible Dictionary helps us here. It says this. It says, Eastern modes of salutation are not unfrequently so prolonged as to become wearisome and a positive waste of time. They profusely, the profusely relate, uh, <laughs> let me try that again. The profusely polite Arab asks so many questions uh, after your health, your happiness, your welfare, your house, and other things. I have often listened to these prolonged salutations in the house, the street, the highway, and not unfrequently I have experienced their tedious monotony, and I have bitterly lamented the useless waste of time. <laughs> That's what Jesus is talking against. Don't get involved in long winded discussions about things that don't matter. He advises the same thing in verse 8. He says, whenever you enter a town and they receive you, eat what is set before you. Anybody hear your mother talking to you? I can hear my mom's voice right now. Eat what is set before you. Is that, is that what Jesus is getting at? Well, that's not quite the way it is. You know, at our house, it was like, eat this. You will eat the spaghetti and you will like it. Well, I may eat it, but I will not like it. I can promise you that. But that's not what Jesus is getting at here. What he's getting at is these 72 were Jewish men. And they were about to go into an area called Perea that was on the eastern shore of the Jordan River where there was a mixture of people. There were some Jews there, but there were also a lot of Gentiles there. And as they went about their mission, 
They didn't know who was gonna invite them in for the night and be hospitable to them, but, but it might be a Gentile. And the next thing they know, they've got pork on the table. And Jews didn't eat pork. They got a good ham dinner, and the Jews didn't eat ham. By the law, they were instructed not to. And so Jesus says, don't worry about that. Just eat what's set before you. So, so what's happening? Is Jesus breaking the law here? No. People miss this, but already, by this time in his ministry, Jesus, who is the Lord of the Sabbath, who made up the rule in the first place, has already said that one's gone. You say, whoa, I thought that came in Acts 10 when Jesus sent Peter down to Cornelius. No, it came long before that. Peter just needed help to do what Jesus had already told him to do a long time ago. It's in Mark. Let me just read it for you. Mark 7, verses 18 and 19, Jesus says, and he said to them, Jesus talking to his disciples, he said, then, then are you also without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes in to a person from outside cannot defile him? Since it enters not his heart, but his stomach, and is an expelled. And then in parens it says, thus he declared all foods clean. Jesus, who had the right to do it, and the only one who had the right to do it, had already declared all foods clean. So it already happened. He's not sending them out to disobey the law, but he's sending them out and saying, listen, whatever your predispositions were originally, forget them. There's a mission that you're on. There's a mission to represent you. There's a mission to get the gospel to these people. And whether they're asking you to eat pork or ham or whatever else you want to eat, eat what is put before you. Don't become entangled in meaningless, wasteful arguments about nothing. Don't waste your time. To me, the message here is similar to what Paul says in Ephesians 5, 16, when he says, making the best use of time. We all only have so much time, beloved. We don't know how much time we have. I think a lot of us are going to have a lot to answer for. How many ways do we allow ourselves to become involved in time-wasting activities? You know what the, the latest surveys now show that the average adult, I know we all have all above average people here, but the average adult spends four and a half hours a day in front of their TV set. Four and a half hours a day. And they spend another five hours, another five hours in non-work-related online activities. Now, that doesn't mean they're not at work when they're doing that, because I've given you those statistics before. Today, the, the latest surveys show that with the internet, people are spending about 40% of their time at work doing non-work-related internet stuff. The shoe fits, wear it. I don't know what to tell you. I know you're not, Stacy, because I know, I know you're boss, so. Right? But you get the point. We're spending four and a half plus five, nine, nine and a half hours a day doing, doing wasteful things. And, and yet we're a society that has no time for anything. I, I ask you, what is it that you're doing that's not on mission. We all need relaxation. I'm not suggesting we don't, that we need time. But it's not, I, I know this, it's not nine and a half hours a day. It isn't. So what are the video games that you're playing and the social media that you're spending time on that's nothing but wasteful time that you could be reading or you could be studying or you could be in some way involved in, in the Word of God or you could be involved with some people over here somewhere, some actual real people. We don't get involved in people anymore. Where's the waste? See, because what does the Bible say? You're going, to answer, you're going to answer for every idle word and every idle moment one day before our Lord. Let me summarize kind of this message this way. We can suffer some temporary persecution temporary persecution for the cause of Christ now and have eternal reward and just the joy of knowing that we are on mission for what that gives meaning to our life. Or we can suffer eternal loss because we got entangled in the empty pleasures and the empty 
activities of this life and forgot our purpose. Some of you may remember the name Isadora Duncan. She was a flamboyant United States, you know, dancer and uh, she, celebrity really back in the 1920s. Lived this, lived this kind of celebrity lifestyle. She was living in Nice, France at the time. This happened to her. She, she had purchased a new, she purchased a brand new sports car and they came and delivered the car and waving to her friends as she was leaving her house, she said, she said, adieu, mes amis. I have to excuse my French. Uh, she said, goodbye, my friends. I am going gloriously. And then she jumped into the car, into the passenger side, while the guy who brought the car was going to take her for her first ride. She threw the red scarf that she had around her neck over the back so it could fly in the breeze. And as the car took off with the roar, the scarf got caught in the spokes of the rear wheel and and uh, got entangled with her neck and broke her neck and she died instantly. Entangled, entangled, entanglement. That's where we are in our lives so often, beloved. We're entangled in things that are starving out the spiritual life and the spiritual disciplines and the mission that God has given us to represent our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Missing out on so much that we could have if we would only live in accordance with the instructions that he gives us. C.S. Lewis said it this way. He said, prosperity, listen to this because it's so true. Prosperity knits a man to the world. Thank God for prosperous people. I'm glad he, I'm, I'm, to be honest with you, I'm praying for prosperous people in our church. And you, you know what? I'm, pr- I'm praying for the ones that will give their money to the Lord's work. I'm not praying for anybody to get prosperous and won't do that. Why does God make us prosperous? He tells us in Ephesians 4.28, along with other places, he gives us money so we can give it away, have the privilege to give it away. Lewis says, prosperity knits a man to the world. He thinks that he is finding his place in the world, but all the while the world is finding its place in him. So where are you in that cycle? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this word. It's powerful. It's such a reminder that we are so easily entangled. Lord, it's not that you don't want us to love the things you give us. You you tell us that it's you that's given us all these good things to enjoy. But the key is to give give them to us to enjoy, not to put them above you, not to let them drive us. But instead, be driven by the mission and the commission you've given us that's in Luke 10, but repeated as your last words practically on your way back to heaven. Go into all the world and make disciples. If we're not spending most of our time in some way associated with that, even in our secular job, we're missing the boat. Teach us, Father, how to do that faithfully. Teach us how to do it with enthusiasm and to do it well for the glory of our great Lord and Savior. I pray in Jesus' name, amen.